You're watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back, everybody. Your host, Michael, on a Tuesday evening, doing something that we haven't done in a while, and that is a roundtable discussion. Pleased to say that we have Father Deacon Anthony Dragati uh, joining us again. Also, Nathaniel McCullum, who is also returning guest, and then uh, new to the show is Father Joseph Matlack, who is uh, joining us here for this discussion. All Eastern Catholics. And the perspective of Eastern Catholicism on Eastern Orthodoxy. So this is going to be really fun. Let me just, first of all, welcome you gentlemen to the show. And uh, Father Joseph, start with you. How are you? Doing very well. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Father Deacon, good to have you back on. Always a pleasure, my friend. And Nathaniel, I think it's been about a year since you've been on. Good to have you back. It's been a busy year, but we always appreciate coming, and it's always a great time. So thanks for having us. Yeah, glad to do it. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's maybe start with um, the question of what what exactly is um, the status of an Eastern Orthodox soteriologically? Um, According to Eastern Catholics, Father Deacon, you're first on my screen, so we'll start with you. Are, Are they saved? Are they damned? Are they somewhere in the middle? What would you say? You know, a a faithful, devout Eastern Orthodox Christian is just as saved as a faithful, devout Catholic. Mm -hmm. That is the the official Catholic position on the matter. Um, You know, there have been arguments that Orthodox are schismatics, but you really can't hold somebody responsible for a schism that was started, you know, a thousand years ago. Um, The truth of the matter is, from a Catholic perspective, they already are Catholic, in a sense, just in an incomplete communion or in a regular state. Hmm. What what exactly is it that they're they're lacking? Uh, the unity that's afforded by communion with Rome. Okay. Right. We, we can see evidence of that being a lack in the sense that uh, within Eastern Orthodoxy, there's a lot of disunity. Um, you know, mm-hmm. just look at the situation between Moscow and uh, Constantinople. Um, mm-hmm. So in, in Catholicism, yeah, we we disagree with each other. There there are fights. There are different you know wings and factions. But there is a, a common unity there that that's, keeps us together, you know, as a family, so to speak, even in the midst of the most uh, intensive squabbles. Now, I can imagine what a lot of the viewers are, and, and listeners are thinking right now, and, and that is, okay, well, how is it that they're just as potentially saved as a Catholic in light of things like unum sanctum, where the Pope dogmatically defines the proposition that, um, you know, all creatures must be um, in communion with the Pope in order to be saved. What would you say to that, Father Deacon? I would say there's a mystical unity that still exists, even if it's not a tangible, visible one. Uh, You know, they're still connected to the church. They still are receiving the same Eucharist. And even if they don't acknowledge the Pope as being a, a legitimate authority, um, the reality is there's a connection there. There's a connection, a mystical connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, an example I've used before is if you have a situation where there's a family and, you know, one of the sons decides to disown the father and to change his name and move far away and claim that the father is not his father, they're still connected, even if the younger son refuses to acknowledge it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nathaniel, let me come to you. What are your thoughts here? Um, Eastern Orthodox, are they saved, damned, somewhere in between? Well, I'll start off with a preamble that um, as the only non-clerical member on this call, I think this affords me uh, only really the latitude to make states with, uh, mistakes with impunity. So <laughs> uh, I, I would really echo a lot of what uh, Father Deacon Anthony said. Um, I, I think it's I think your question itself uh, is an interesting one because uh, you phrased it in terms of an individual Eastern Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so there's actually sort of two related questions here, right? Like Mm -hmm. is Orthodoxy itself Mm -hmm. uh, as a a unit, right? A a schismatic church. Right. Uh, But there's a separate question, which is, is an individual believer uh, a, a schismatic? Okay. And these are really two very, very different questions. 
Um, and in fact, I would answer uh, to the personal one, they may or may not be, right? Uh, right. This is somewhat independent to the state of the institution. But in terms of the state of the institution, I find it really, really fascinating that um, even at the worst relationships between uh, Rome and the Eastern churches, uh, we might think here of, say, like the middle of the 19th century, or when Pope Nias, Pius IX um, publishes his encyclical to the Greeks in Greek and distributes it directly to the people. And uh, we get the famous encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs right. um, uh, back. This, this sort of represents a, a low point of relationship between the two churches. At no point does, even in this uh, encyclical, does Rome ever call the Eastern churches schismatic, right? Mm -hmm. And Rome is very, very intentionally hesitant to uh, use the term schism to apply to the status of the Eastern churches. But, of course, Rome defines schism, of course, you can see it in the catechism, as the refusal to submit to the Roman pontiff or a bishop in communion with him. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't Orthodox fit the bill? Uh, possibly so. Um, I, I would uh, respond to that. The catechism, of course, is an incredibly important document, um, but it is not a dogmatic definition. And... Um, you know, there have obviously been many changes to the catechism over time. I'm not trying to dismiss it, right? It, it is a very important source. Um, but the the actual dogmatic definitions, right? When you when you look, for example, at Vatican I, they tend to use the same ambiguity that's found uh, in the famous statement of uh, Ignatius of Antioch, uh, where he says. Where the bishop is, let the people be assembled, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the church, right? And so we, we tend to read this statement as where the bishop is, there is the church. Uh, but there's actually a slight ambiguity in that statement um, that where the church is, that's where the people should, or where the bishop is, that's where the people should gather. But where Christ is, there is the church. And we see a sort of similar um play on words even in the even in the uh, dogmatic definitions of vatican one and i'm not trying to say that these are purposefully ambiguous but it does seem to me that there is some tension here even even in the official proclamations of the catholic church so uh, i think we should be very careful to uh first of all attribute a schismatic status to the eastern churches there's a long history there with a lot of complexity, particularly imperial complexity, uh, which which we want to take into consideration. And um, and then second, of course, uh, we shouldn't uh, mix the difference between an individual being a schismatic versus uh, a church being in the state of schism. There are very clearly, by the way, other churches that are very clearly in the state of schism. Uh, and so I'm not trying to deny wholesale that that there is a category of schism. There clearly is, and there are clearly some churches that that fit that category. Uh, I just think that it's not an appropriate category to talk about uh, the Eastern Orthodox churches. Excellent. Now, Father Joseph, let me come to you. What what are your thoughts here as far as Eastern Orthodoxy from an Eastern Catholic perspective? Well, uh, as uh, as was just mentioned, there's the reality of the episcopacy. And, you know, an Eastern Catholic Church, for example, is uh, spoken of in the law as a body of believers at the head of which is a father, namely the bishop or the hierarch. Well, apostolic orders, the validity of apostolic orders has always been recognized uh, um, among other bodies, the, uh, the Orthodox churches. And so I, when, when you look at that, then you can see a church. There is a church because there is a bishop uh, over uh, a group of believers, uh, who we can call a diocese or, or a particular church or a local church. So the issue is exactly how does that play in to the uh, pyramidal structure that we've inherited in the Catholic communion of churches? Because, of course, the Catholic communion has more of a pyramidal structure. At the top, you have the Pope of Rome. Uh, and, well, at least once upon a time, you could say that all the Catholic bishops were seen as deputies of the Pope of Rome, whereas the Orthodox have a very different uh, approach. And one could argue that that approach is being adopted uh, even uh, more and more within the Catholic Church, especially since the Second Vatican Council. So uh, with that in mind, if we're looking at those two realities, the validity of the orders, the experience, the Eucharistic experience, experience of the apostolic churches of the East, which we call the Orthodox churches, the non-Catholic Eastern churches, and see how is that related to what's going on in the West, 
Then the most important question is, to what extent are Orthodox Christians or even Orthodox churches knowingly, willingly, and consciously uh, rejecting uh, the, 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 the Church of Rome and to what extent that uh, that can can play into this? So that's you know the, the the celebrating Eucharistic liturgical church is is what comes to my mind, particularly as an Eastern Christian, albeit in communion with Rome. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, in in my experience, uh, looking outwards, if you will, looking at those non-Catholic Orthodox churches, I almost see uh, a parallel with my own experience. I see uh, a brother or, or a sibling or whatever you want to whatever you want to call it a sibling church that's doing and thinking and acting in the same way that I am, it just so happens that I'm, you know, uh, um, de facto in communion with the Pope of Rome, uh, with whom they are not. Mm. And so it's a very strange position to be in, especially when the rubber meets the road of Mm. Eucharistic liturgical practice, lived experience. Now, let me stir things up here. For, for the end of round one. And then we're going to re- move to round two where I ask you all questions, uh, you know, a, a different question and come to each one of y'all. But here at the end of this first round, I'm just going to kind of open it up for anybody who wants to respond. I'm going to throw something out here and I want to get y'all's thoughts on it. Again, anybody can, can speak. It'll be a free for all. Um, <clears throat> what would you say to these two propositions that number one, the Orthodox church, objectively speaking, is technically in schism, according to the definition of not being in communion with the Roman pontiff, the one that we mentioned earlier uh, from the catechism. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that each individual, as Nathaniel was mentioning earlier, is culpable for being you know, in schism. So in other words, you might have an individual who's objectively in schism, but not necessarily culpable for it because it's not it's not something that they're intending to do. They don't intend to um, be in a, a, a communion that has some kind of imperfection. They don't intend to have any imperfection with Christ um, ecclesiologically. So that's proposition one. And then number two, when we are speaking there about unum sanctum and the necessity of being, uh, being in communion with the Roman pontiff for salvation, what would you say to the proposition that um, the, one of the reasons why we can speak about individual Orthodox being um, saved is because we can speak about them informally being in communion with the Pope because they're not intentionally intending to um, put separation between themselves and God by not being in communion with the successor of St. Peter. They, in fact, don't believe what we believe about the papacy. So it's not as if they're intending to put some kind of impediment there. I know that's a lot uh, with, the, with those two propositions, but go ahead and jump in. Anybody, what do y'all think about that? I'm going to jump on the second proposition. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think for the vast majority of Eastern Orthodox, they do not intend to not be in communion with Rome. It's not something mm-hmm. that really has a, a, an impact on them directly in their day-to-day lives. And most of them don't think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reality is the Pope and Rome and the grand scheme of things has very little impact on the day-to-day spiritual lives of most Catholics as well. Uh, we tend to fixate on that position, the Pope of Rome. A lot of it's because of the, the media. The media gives a lot of attention. But before the rise of the modern media, the Pope in Rome was a much more distant figure to most Catholics as well, who had very little impact on the day-to-day spiritual lives of Catholics. So I'd say the vast majority of Orthodox do not intend to not be in communion with Rome. It's just it's just something that they're kind of born into. Now, I want to clarify that. There are some Orthodox Christians who thrive on being separated from Rome. There are some who define themselves on being separated from Rome, and they make anti-Western, anti-Roman polemics their their trade. Um, there are quite a few of them on the internet. I've met a few in real life. I've met way more on the internet. And those individuals, uh, I would say, are objectively if not in a state of schism, they are fermenting schism and they are trying to keep schism alive. And sadly, I meet more and more of these people every day, primarily online. Yeah. Um, Nathaniel, I, 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 Father Joseph, I want yeah, to respond ahead. actually to something he said, which is uh, just on a practical basis. Um, I was uh, in the OCA for 10 years and my lived experience on the ground uh, echoes completely what Father Deacon Anthony is saying, um, mm-hmm. that the vast majority of people are trying in a uh, age of secularism to hold a tie to their faith 
and to their uh, pre-enlightenment culture uh, within which that faith is embodied. And uh, that is their primary concern. And sometimes they latch on to rejection of Rome as sort of a means by which to do that. Uh, it, and I think it's incredibly regrettable, but I would completely agree with Father Deacon Anthony that the vast majority um, are, are not aware of doing this consciously whatsoever. And uh, that there are those, however, who do sort of trade in these polemics um, in order to substantiate their own spiritual life. And I think we can recognize that as spiritually destructful. Right. So um, mm -hmm. not only to themselves, but also to the communion between the churches. So, but the, but the people who aren't, you know, intending to put an impediment, wouldn't, wouldn't you say that there's a sense in which they're informally united uh, to the, the Roman pontiff in the same way that we might speak about um, somebody who uh, a catechumen who dies before they reach the baptismal font, maybe they weren't formally received, but they weren't intending to put in any kind of impediment there. They they were, if you will, informally a member of the church already. Yeah, Could I, we speak about Orthodox in that way? I, I, I agree with that assumption. Um, I think it's important to clarify that with saying that we are not trying to adopt a Protestant notion of an invisible church, which is clearly uh, not Catholic teaching, and it's not Orthodox teaching either. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we are not trying to assert that there is merely an invisible church and that anyone who has ever uh, you know, received an Episcopal ordination that's valid is somehow in that church. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there is a strong tendency to sort of relate one's communion to a notion of original sin. This is oftentimes done implicitly um, mm -hmm. with this note that like somehow if you are just in a body which is not in full communion with Rome, that somehow you are culpable of that act that was perpetrated generations ago. And, mm -hmm. and I think that we should recognize that this is the case and that we should firmly reject this analogy. The reason why we should reject this analogy is because um, original sin itself is predicated on human sexual rep uh, reproduction as the means by which uh, sin is transferred from generation to generation in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there is no such mechanism for ecclesial communion. Uh, the only mechanism which we could have uh, in order to accomplish that is uh, the one which would say that a sacrament is valid based upon the status, the moral status of the person who's performed it, mm -hmm. which is already a position that has been widely condemned by the church. And, and therefore, this is really not an apt analogy. So we should recognize that when people are trying to sort of smuggle this analogy into this question of the relationship of the churches, we should identify that that is what it is, and we should we should reject it based upon the fact that it really doesn't, uh, it's not a fitting analogy, and it doesn't uh, meet the theological criteria uh, for these topics. And, and let me ask you a, a quick follow-up question before we come to you, Father Joseph. Um, so you, you had mentioned there, there, there's a difference between those who actually, you know, maybe start a schism versus those who are kind of born into it. So what where, where does that leave uh, Mark of Ephesus? What, what, what do you think of him? I, I think it's a great question, right? And I yeah. think that there's a further distinction that needs to be made here. And I'm, and I'm not trying to add distinctions here into irrelevance, right? But I am trying to appropriately grapple with the realities on the ground, which is frankly mm -hmm. a, a property that the Catholic Church does really, really well with. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we sort of have something funny happening with the way that the meaning of the word schism has evolved over time, oftentimes implicitly and with no dogmatic definition, no philosophical inquiry into the nature of this change. Um, the original meaning of schism means to erect a foreign altar, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, when, you know, Novation is not happy about the election of the Bishop of Rome, he gets himself ordained bishop and he sets up a parallel hierarchy in the Church of Rome. And this is what we mean par excellence when we're talking about schism. Um, but somehow the word schism has morphed over time to implicitly mean the group that I don't like. And uh, I think that that definition is wholly inadequate. Uh, and perhaps there is a broader sense of schism we can talk about, but we really need good theological definition here if we're going to throw around that term, because it's a term that has a lot of implications and we need to use it accurately. So um, this is why I've been trying to say that, you know, let's take, let's take Mark of Ephesus as an example, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, Mark of Ephesus clearly did not set up a parallel hierarchy. 
although he did demur from the Council of Florence, he mm -hmm. did not go around, uh, you know, he didn't go to Rome and set up a separate, a separate episcopacy in Rome. And in fact, mm -hmm. no Orthodox church has ever done this. Uh, there has not been the erection, you know, it's not like, uh, even in the... Um, even in the famous, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs, uh, mm -hmm. there is a zero uh, intention to suggest that uh, Pope uh, Pius is, uh, is not the Bishop of Rome, right? There's no set of occultism at all in that sort of language. And, and so um, th there's no attempt here to set up a foreign altar. So that means that if we are going to apply the term schism to this category, then we need to do so in one of the broader expanded meanings. But these meanings have never been theologically defined. And so if we're going to try to do that, we need to define them. We need to define what the criteria are and how they actually apply to these cases. And this is something which most people have no interest in. They just want to sling uh, mud. Uh, on their opponents. And now, so yeah. this is not an appropriate uh, method of Christian charity. Now, I wonder if it's possible to say that, okay, well, objectively, since Mark of Ephesus was not in communion with the Roman pontiff, objectively, there there was a schismatic status there, but maybe not necessarily um, one that was culpable. And, and, and some might say, well, wait, wouldn't Mark of Ephesus be the person who's most culpable. I mean, he, he knows all of the arguments, right? And still rejected the, the papacy, at least as Catholics were proposing it. But I, I would like to mention a, an important distinction. It's not enough to merely say that a person is aware of the Catholic claims. It has to be presented to them in a way that's convincing, and then they still reject it. Now culpability is, is there. Um, and I'm not sure that that was necessarily presented to Mark of Ephesus. I'm not exactly sure that you know, it was presented to him in a in a cogent uh, way and, and one where he still then rejected it. So I'm not speaking about his his destiny or his soul or him subjectively. Um, but couldn't we still say that objectively, if he's not in communion with the Roma Pontiff, technically he was in schism? Um, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me add another criteria here. Um, which is that uh, we clearly have these definitions, right, of the, of the necessity to be in communion with Peter. And, and I'm not rejecting those in any regard. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think we should deploy the hermeneutic of continuity here, mm -hmm. right, which is that the, the dogmatic definitions of, for example, Vatican I need mm -hmm. to be interpreted in the light of the tradition of the church, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, are, they are not something that is radical and new. And in fact, one of the biggest concerns of Vatican I uh, after the council was, is this a, representing a substantial change to which official clarification from Rome was, no, it is not, right? The bishop is not merely, uh, the bishop of Rome is not the direct administrator of every diocese of the church. Right. right. This was this was part of the official clarification of the Council of Vatican I. Right. And so Rome itself, while there are in these interpretations of these documents, Rome has always sought to clarify these documents in coherence with the tradition of the church. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves if the dogmatic definition of, for example, Vatican I is uh, you know, is true in dogma, and it is, of course, and we are interpreting it according to tradition, well, then what could it mean in the context of the Eastern churches, who throughout the first millennium were never directly subjugated uh, administratively to the Church of Rome? And this, is, this has been clearly and explicitly stated in the ecumenical dialogues, uh, both, you know, uh, the document of Pieti, the document of Ravenna, um, this, is, this is assumed by everyone on every side of this, of this, um, um, you know, uh, dialogue. So anyway, I've taken up way too much time and I'd really like to hear from Father yeah, Joseph. Fa Father Joseph, uh, um, what, what are your thoughts here? I was actually going to say the same thing, that when ecumenical dialogue is conducted, um, I'm not really aware of anything that says, okay, let's, let's settle the question of do you submit immediately to the primacy of the Roman pontiff? If not, then the discussion can't continue. Mm -hmm. Usually the discussion takes place on terms of uh, specific points of belief. And so if I put myself in the position of a mark of Ephesus, if I dare to do that, then I'm thinking to myself, well, Rome is approaching me as a member of this church over here. And we're grappling not about the finer points of the Roman uh, primacy, but about these points of belief. And of course, it is wrapped in the paper of uh, of Roman primacy for various historical reasons. But really the, the issue here is uh, an entire church 
dealing with another church. Mm. And so the question is, and, and what came to my mind was the uh, Augustinian Cyprianic uh, debate about whether grace exists within the church only or outside the church or to what extent. And that's really at the core of this is um, to what extent can we have a very hard line approach to the boundaries and borders of the church such that grace cannot be said to exist outside of the church. And, and I've read Orthodox scholars themselves who, who disagree with this. Um, I'm, I'm told that more and more are adopting the Cyprianic position. Mm -hmm. That certainly wasn't the case with every Orthodox scholar I've read. And so that's the issue here is that uh, we have now, uh, ecclesiologically speaking, we're dealing with multiple churches. And actually, I think the Augustinian approach is, is conducive to that because what it does is it recognizes uh, you have one church who claims X, another church claims Y. Well, which one is right? And if they are both somehow uh, capturing the truth in some way, shape or form, then is there some sort of grace operating there? And therefore, when you ask a question like schism, uh, to what extent can we actually uh, apply that to, to this? I think, if I'm not mistaken, the original meaning of the word schism is a tear or a rip. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, immediately I'm thinking mystically of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. The body of Christ has tears. And when Christ rose from the dead, he presented the tears to the world, almost saying, you know, uh, um, you know, the, the, almost foreshadowing the schism. The schism will be there in the body of Christ. So again, I'm thinking Augustin, Augustinianically, if that's even a word. Uh, in the future, you have these, these apostolic churches, which are de facto in schism with each other. I'm, I'm not going to the question yet of, of the primacy or not, but they're in schism with each other. And how can we understand the operation of grace in and through that de facto situation. So that's what came to my mind. And, and I also agree with Father uh, Dick Anthony. Culturally speaking, most Orthodox um, are, are not uh, uh, having this theological discussion that we're having right now. I, I remember the time I was in Moscow, and um, I, I'd been there for the first time, and uh, my dear friend introduced me to her grandmother. And somehow the discussion came into, into Buddhism. I forget what exactly happened. But uh, this, this very simple, uh, faithful believer who actually uh, witnessed the destruction of Christ the Savior Cathedral as well as its rebuilding um, in whenever it was rebuilt. Uh, I remember she said, well, um, she sort of thought that there were only two religions in the world, uh, orthodoxy, which was the true religion, and everything else was Catholicism. And uh, I remember even uh, I arrived there before January the 7th, so they offered me Catholic cake, which happened to be Black Forest Ghetto. And uh, it was referred as Catholic cake because that's just anything not not Russian was Catholic or not Russian or Greek or Serbian was was or, or any of the others was Catholic. And then when it got to the discussion about Buddhism, I remember very very um, poignantly her question was, well, do they at least have the Eucharist? Um, and so it just showed me very very um, starkly that there's just a cultural uh, sense that they grew up with, that there's only two things in the world. There's Orthodox and there's Catholics. Or if you go to Greece, uh, there are those who don't say the Filioque, and there are those who do say the Filioque, and those who say the Filioque are heretics. Mm -hmm. um, and and so really that's the situation. But yes, most people in my experience um, aren't, uh, aren't thinking of this, which then tells me that the, the culpability is is low, if not even non-existent. They're just right. doing, they believe in their conscience to be right. Now, Father, Father Joseph, you had mentioned there uh, about, you know, how, how exactly can we speak about uh, Eastern Orthodox having uh, grace? Let, let me let me maybe throw this out and get your thought, your thoughts. Um, well, I, I would say that we can speak about them having grace because, of course, they are valid local churches with bishops, apostolic succession, valid sacraments. Therefore, the gift grace is being offered in the sacraments and individually if they're not intentionally putting impediments between them and God, they're receiving the sacraments, they're receiving grace, and, and of course, they're, they're being deified. Um, now, if they put an impediment between them and God, like anybody else, they're, they're putting they're a barrier between them and, and the grace that they're being offered. So I, could, I, I can see how we can speak about the Orthodox being saved if we're speaking on that level, but then I could also say, 
when it comes to the universal level, objectively speaking, they would still be in schism because they're not in communion with the Roman pontiff, and yet they might not be culpable for it. So that that's how at least I understand it. That's how I'm able to maintain both concepts by saying that technically they're in schism, yet they could still be saved and not culpable for that schism because they're receiving grace in the sacraments. What, what do you think about that? I think that that would be uh, right. I think when you look at the the objective, I'm thinking like a Latin scholastic now, and I look at the objective ex opere operato uh, sense of grace uh, of the sacraments and grace in the sacraments. Of mm -hmm. course, a scholastic might then argue that uh, uh, any sacrament conducted outside of the church uh, is is um, you know is seriously affected by that. But uh, that's that's another question altogether. But I think when it when you look at the um, Culpability is, is, is important in this because culpability in sin means to know that the tear which you're about to cause, namely the schism, is a tear in the very body of Christ itself. And you're aware of this and you do it despite knowing that that, that is the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yes, I would say those who have greater knowledge, yeah. I mean, this is even a biblical thing, those who have greater knowledge have greater responsibility in that. So yes, uh, if, the, if there are theologians or hierarchs who do know what they are doing, of course, that is uh, a culpable act. Mm -hmm. uh, but for those who are participating in the, the holy mysteries, the sacraments, uh, it's an entirely different question in my, in my opinion. Objectively, yes, you could mm -hmm. say, uh, if I'm walking down the street and I see two people, um, you know, pummeling somebody else, uh, the one, is uh, is uh, beating someone up just for the fun of it. The other one happens to be defending someone who's helpless. Uh, to my objective eye, it looks like the same act. However, mm. um, there is something deeper going on, and that's why um, the notion of you know race is so mysterious because you can't really judge uh, externally. So this whole strict division between you know, saved and damned—it's it's not something that the apostolic churches like uh, it's it's a very um reformation and, and certainly you know calvinist reformation thing uh, as opposed to the um the delicate nuance of the apostolic position or at least let's say that we're struggling with that nuance and the fact that we're struggling with that nuance even between the east and the west shows that uh shows that it exists there is a nuance there and we really need to take uh, note of that now let's move to round two here should Eastern Catholics become Eastern Orthodox? Now, some some might ask, well, wait, I thought we were talking about Eastern Orthodox, not Eastern Catholicism becoming e Eastern Orthodox. What, what, what gifts? The reason why I ask this question is because I think it's actually enlightening about what we think about the Orthodox ecclesiologically, maybe even a little bit more than what we have discussed so far. If Eastern Catholics should not become Eastern Orthodox, I would like to know uh, why you would say they shouldn't. Let's start with you, Father Deacon. Right. So I think Eastern Catholics should not become Eastern Orthodox. A number of reasons why. You know, part of it is we already are Orthodox in the sense of having the same tradition, the same liturgy, the same spirituality, much of the same theology. Mm. Uh, but on a bigger level, for an Eastern Catholic to break communion with Rome is also to break communion with a variety of other Eastern traditions. Uh, that's one of the beauties of the Catholic Communion. You know, you have Maronite Catholics, Syro Malabar, Syro Malankara, Coptic, Ethiopian. There's a whole variety there. Uh, a real, how should I put it? A real diversity of tradition within this universal church. Eastern Orthodoxy tends to be primarily Byzantine. There are some Western Rite parishes, but even they have been extremely, uh, you know, Westernized. I mean, I mean Byzantineized. Um, so you're breaking community, not just with Rome, but with a whole universal body of tradition. But beyond that, and this for me is the big one, within Eastern Orthodoxy, whether or not Catholic sacraments have grace is still an open question for the most part. You can be an Orthodox Christian in good standing and teach that Catholic sacraments are invalid, that Catholics are worshiping bread, that Catholic baptism is meaningless. I've read articles written by, you know, rather uh, respected Orthodox theologians arguing that St. Francis was possessed by the devil. Mm -hmm. 
you know, these are positions that are legitimate with an orthodoxy. You can hold those positions. I personally could not move from the communion that I'm in into a communion where that's an acceptable position because I know that I'm receiving the Eucharist in the Eucharist. I'm receiving Christ in the Eucharist. I know that that truly is the body and blood of Christ. I know that my baptism brought me enlightenment. You know, mm -hmm. it was a gateway for me to enter salvation. I've seen Christ working through the sacraments of the Catholic Church. I cannot deny that. And if I were to become Orthodox, I'd be going into a realm where it's okay to deny that. And I personally would find that to be a bit of a betrayal of what I know to be true. Okay. Uh, Nathaniel, what about you? Uh, let me let me start by responding to Father Deacon Anthony, which is that mm -hmm. um, I would I would not call those positions acceptable positions within Orthodoxy. Uh, that that implies a certain amount of um, agreement with them. I, I would actually argue something slightly different, which is that um, because the Orthodox uh, lack the uh, specific charism that Peter brings to the churches, right. Um, that it is very difficult for them to speak uniformly on uh, and authoritatively on any issue. Mm -hmm. And so what we actually see happening in the Eastern churches is that there's a sort of theological free-for-all because no one can actually be held account to much of anything unless it is unambiguously defined, for example, in the first seven ecumenical councils. Right. And so I would, I would not say that at least, and again, this comes from my experience having been Orthodox for 10 years, um, that it's not that these positions are sort of acceptable. It's that there's not really any enforcement of any sort of theological speech. A, a sort of great uh, example of this is that if you look in canon law, uh, it explicitly defines when you are allowed to say that something is Catholic. Right. So you, you can't say that this is, you know, the, the Catholic reason and theology show, because uh, you actually have to have go through certain um, you know, uh, certain uh, processes in order to get that label. Right. There is no such parallel in modern orthodoxy. And so anyone can sort of stand up and say this is the orthodox opinion on something. And there's nothing really to stop them from doing so. And so I think it's disorganized. And I think that there is. Uh, very often a lack of uh, any sort of authoritative teaching that leads to this. But I don't think they're like approved or official or accepted positions. They're just simply tolerated because everything is tolerated. Um, mm -hmm. let, me, let me go back to the, to the actual question at hand here, mm -hmm. um, which is, should Eastern Catholics become um, Eastern Orthodox? Um, and I'm going to answer a second question, which you didn't ask. Which is should Eastern Catholic or should Eastern Orthodox become Eastern Catholics? Yep. Uh, and I'm going to answer no to both of those questions, and that may seem a, a little bit surprising. Um, I think that any time that someone changed churches, and I've changed churches twice, so I have a little bit of experience here, um, that there is a real spiritual damage that happens even when one is going from a false faith to a true faith. Right. So I, I don't mean here that there's not any reason ever to convert from one religion re religion to another, but it doesn't come without cost to the person, to their societal uh, surroundings, to their even to their soul, uh, and that has to be weighed against the uh, the cost essentially uh, of of joining the churches. So, for example. You know, if a person is happily Eastern Orthodox and uh, they're living in a community, they're a part of their church, they're regularly attending the sacraments, um, they are attending their spiritual life, they are growing, and they become convinced uh, that they should change churches by someone on the internet, which is very often the, the way that this happens, right? They then immediately tear away from a spiritual community, they socially isolate themselves, and they come generally to... Uh, attach themselves to another community without real lived experience in that community. And, and this is personally dangerous, right? Because what we often see is that people who go through these, uh, these conversions, they don't stop converting. So they'll convert, you know, from one thing to another, but then the, when the next thing comes along, that goes as well, right? And this is because our faith is actually lived communally. And uh, we, we are gathering around the one sacrifice of Christ, right? And to, to sort of tear that um, when it doesn't need to be torn, for example, if salvation is not the question, um, then we should be careful. There's another practical reality here, too, which is that one of the tendencies, one of the problems of the foundations of the Eastern churches is that it gave a place to drain 
charitable Christians from the Eastern churches, leaving only schismatic uh, voices in those in those churches. Right. So, uh, you know, if if, for example, 15th century uh, Constantinople was 50-50 in terms of whether it should unite with Rome, and then Rome creates a place for all of those charitable Eastern Christians to go. What's left in Constantinople is these gr is this group of loud voices that want to separate from Rome. But this is actually not productive in terms of the goal, the explicit stated goal of Rome, which is to reunite the churches, right? Not not to win some pot shots of, of sheep stealing. Right. And so this is this is a very practical reality. So generally, I am against uh, in terms of Eastern Orthodox and Eastern Catholics, I'm generally against uh, converting and that one should work out their salvation in the in the field in which they're planted. So let me ask this. What if that individual Eastern Orthodox comes to the realization that they need to be in communion with the pope? You would still on the whole recommend that they remain where they are? then they should dedicate their life sacrificially to working for that position where they are, because there's no other way that the union of the churches will actually happen. Okay. And Father Joseph, where do you land on this? Well, I mean, I often call myself an Orthodox Christian in communion with Rome, and I know that that upsets a lot of Eastern Orthodox Christians. But the reason I say that is practically I have a hard time uh, understanding how I'm not, because I am praying uh, the prayers of the Orthodox churches. Sometimes I'm using the exact same texts. I, I utilize only what is officially approved uh, in my church, Sui Iuris, which is basically the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. That's the only thing that is officially approved. Everything else is either uh, approved in another language or in Slavonic or Greek, but in terms of the English translations, I am praying the Orthodox prayers uh, on a daily basis, and therefore I'm learning to pray and think as an Orthodox Christian, uh, particularly when we look at the liturgy as the source, the primary source of theology. Mm -hmm. I'm also reading the same fathers, and the, in some cases the same spiritual works as uh, Orthodox Christians, both traditional and contemporary. Um, I have a particular love, for example, for um, Siloan of Athos uh, or, or other authors, Seraphim of Sarov and, and, and other authors. And so when I look at what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, I am doing Eastern Christianity. Uh, it just so happens that my bishop is in communion with the Pope of Rome. And so uh, when, I, when I look at should an Eastern Catholic become uh, Eastern Orthodox, mm -hmm. I usually ask the question, uh, has that Eastern Catholic realized yet who he or she is or who he or she is called to be? And per the teachings of the church, or at least per the vision of the church, we are supposed to be um, fully, fully Eastern in our theology, in our spirituality, in our liturgy and in our canon law. And yes, we are working that out. And yes, there are some historical um, hiccups along the way, some greater than others in terms of things like Latinization and things of that nature. At the same time, though, it, in my opinion, it has never been a better time to be an Eastern Catholic. We have all the support in the teaching of the church to be who we are. And so the only ones who can ruin that experience, in my opinion, is, is, is us, we, we do this to ourselves. Once upon a time, I think we could blame the Latins, but uh, not anymore. I think it's never been a better time to be an Eastern Christian and in communion with Rome and to serve as an image of how that might work, both on a theoretical and a practical level. I think our position is invaluable, and so I would not want to see uh, people leaving that uh, for a supposed purity in okay. Eastern non-Catholic church, because I don't think that will exist. I think there'll always be some, some issues here or there. 
Well, so so I guess here here's you know the the second part of round two, and again it'll just gotta be a free for all. Open it up. So my position is going to be that an Eastern Catholic should not become Eastern Orthodox because they are objectively losing something, and that is universal, um, their universal ecclesiology. There, and in fact, I would say that universal ecclesiology is essential to the constitution of the universal church because it's something that was established by Jesus. So you would be leaving something essential. Um, and I would say on the flip side, an Eastern Orthodox should with, you know, I, I understand what you were saying there, Nathaniel, but I'm just saying objectively, if they come to the um, conviction of being in communion with the Pope, they should um, become in communion with the Pope. They should um, become Catholic because they are gaining something. So that, I guess, is is where I land on the matter. Go ahead and uh, offer your thoughts. Anybody who wants to jump in. Anyone? <laughs> Any well, I think the, the document in Ravenna, um, Michael, the 2007 document, doesn't that open up the universal level of ecclesiology? Uh, isn't that really what the international dialogue was beginning to broach? That, that mm -hmm. you know, just we have a local level, so we have a regional level, but we also have a universal level, and that is mm -hmm. the benefit of the Catholic Communion churches. But this is this is also why I think it's inadequate to deploy only the objective state of schism and culpability distinction, right? Mm -hmm. that, that is an important distinction. It is a modern Latin one, um, at least in terms of its origins, but I'm not saying it's invalid because of that, right? All right. Um, but it is, I think, in inadequate to fully describe the situation, which is that the Roman church strenuously avoids using the term schism to speak of the objective status of the Eastern churches. Sure. Right. And so um, the sort of, the sort of um, razor that we are being asked to, uh, to split our hairs on here is how do we deal with salvation when they are in schism? And I think that I want to say they are not in schism, at least not in any uh, official state um you know, according to according to the doctrine of the church, a, a great example of this, I think, is the fact that um, Eastern Orthodox can approach a, a Catholic minister to receive the Eucharist, right? Mm -hmm. But there's mo something more that needs to be said here um, that they may do so without any agreement between the churches, right? So there's not like the two churches sat down together and came to an agreement. The Roman Church has officially stated that this is their policy unilaterally. But this differs, for example, with uh, the way that the Roman Church treats, for example, the uh, Polish National Catholic Church uh, in the United States. They, too, have a limited access to communion under certain circumstances, but this was only accomplished by an official dialogue between the churches and by a, a, a agreed-upon statement between the churches. That's objectively different than the state of the Eastern churches, right? So that, we could say, is a church that was in schism but is moving toward communion and that, that this is an intermediary step that we have accomplished through this agreement. But with the Eastern uh, churches, with the Eastern Christians who are not currently in full communion, there is not an agreement. There is no dialogue that's happening as a, pre as a necessary, no contract that's being signed. There is just simply the offer of communion within these circumstances. And so I think that this represents that the Eastern churches are not officially in the state of schism, at least not in the uh, full sense of that word, which bears the full canonical penalty which is why I want to reject the statement uh, or the assertion that they are objectively in schism in that sense. We may mm -hmm. talk about schism in a more broad sense, but that more broad sense does not have the full canonical penalty associated with it, right? And so mm -hmm. this is why the distinctions we make here are incredibly important and how we use our language is incredibly important. I thought the canonical penalty had to do with refusal to submit to the Roman pontiff. The canonical penalty does uh, has it, it has to do with um, the question of jurisdiction, right, as defined mm. uh, by Vatican I. Uh, we're, we're here mixing um, two different definitions, right? One from Unum Sanctum in the 14th century, early 14th century, uh, and the other from Vatican I. Uh, Vatican I's concern is about jurisdiction. Uh, the, the, I, I would have to look more, more uh, carefully mm. at Unum Sanctum, uh, to be fair. But um, the... It is possible for us to say that in a certain regard that um, 
these churches are in an imperfect communion, which I think mm -hmm. is the only really sensible way that we can argue about this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be Pollyanna here. I'm not trying to say that, you know, there's just, if we, if we can just ignore everything for a moment that everything is perfect and fine. I'm not saying that, but what I'm, what I'm also not saying is that, um, we have achieved the status of full and complete schism because clearly we haven't. And so we are sort of in this gray ambiguous area, era, uh, area in the middle and that this has been reinforced time and time again by the language of the pontiffs, uh, by the, di the uh, parameters of the ecumenical dialogue. And so, yeah, it's an ambiguity, but I think it's an ambiguity we have to live with because A, it's part of the apostolic uh, teaching, which is incredibly subtle, as, as Father Joseph has mentioned, uh, and does have itself a lot of nuance. And um, further, it's it's the official teaching of the Church of Rome, which is, seems to be very happy to live sort of within this ambiguity. So I think it's one that we have to um, learn to live out in the uh, in the best way that we can. Let me put it in a, a syllogism here, um, and tell me where I'm wrong. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the first premise would be Christians should accept every teaching handed down by God. Second premise, the necessity of being in communion with the Pope is a teaching handed down by God. Therefore, Orthodox should embrace the teaching that they must be in communion with Rome. Where did I go wrong? Say, say the second statement again, please. The necessity of being in communion with the Pope is a teaching handed down by God. Okay. Uh, can you define precisely what it means to be in communion with the Pope? That if you're a bishop, you uh, share in sacred things, especially the Eucharist with Pope. And if you're not a bishop, uh, that you are a member or that you are under a bishop who is in communion with Rome. And as that Ignatius of, would understand. Is that part of the definition and, and where is it defined? Um, so the necessity of being communion with Rome, I'm basing this on how to understand communion. I'm basing this on Ignatius of Antioch, okay. either that, you, that you're in communion with a bishop that has apostolic succession. But then what happens when you have a bishop, you know, two different bishops in the same territory that both have apostolic succession? Well, the way to differentiate between the one who has um, who has the authority to be there and the one that shouldn't be there is Again, going to be based on communion with Rome, and that's going to Correct. go back to Uno okay. Santo. And, and you've just deployed the term schism in the fullest sense, the one that, that uh, obtains the most stringent canonical penalty, which is that of a parallel altar, right? And how we determine which one is the correct altar in the state of parallel altars is that one is in communion with Rome. Objectively. Not, yeah. That is not the situation we have today, right? It's not like... Uh, yes, there was a there is a, a Latin patriarchate, but that was actually something that the popes uh, refused to agree with for a very long time, and only acquiesced when it was very clear that the Venetians uh, had clear control of the city of Constantinople, and only only then was um, you know was that status actually granted. Um, in terms of setting up an, another altar when the Greeks reconquered the city, uh, while it's true that titularly we have a patriarch of Constantinople, in La, uh, a succession of Latin patriarchs of Constantinople, there's no parallel altar set up. It's not like Rome, you know, took another army and went and set up another another parallel altar. So we, we clearly don't objectively have that that precise situation. Uh, the situation that we actually have is one that's far more nuanced. It's one where, um, for example. Um, you know, in the 13th century, when Rome asks Constantinople why it's not celebrated in the, dis in the diptychs, the answer was, well, you never sent us a notification of your election, right? And, and that's just an entirely different scenario, objectively mm. speaking. So if mm. we're going to talk about objective reality, then we actually have to deal with the objective reality that's on the ground. So what, what is communion with Rome for, in your understanding? Uh, communion with Rome is, I think, we, I would speak... Um, in that good com uh, Scottish common sense realism, yes, there is there is communion with Rome, but I would say that the full canonic canonical pen penalty for not communion with Rome uh, yeah. has not yet been met. And but, so, while we type, yeah. while we want to think of this as a strict binary, I think there's a very clear definition for where we go over the edge on either side. But there mm -hmm. is some limited gray area in the middle. I'm not saying that it's all gray. I'm saying yeah. that there is some room for that. So let, let me let me rephrase it then. Um, I, I would I would imagine that you would agree that it is something handed down by God that one should be in communion with the Roman Pontiff, the successor of Saint Peter. I, I would imagine you would agree with that so far, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, if a, if an Orthodox is going to 
accept everything that has been handed down? Should they also accept that? Whatever it means, well, should they accept it? Let me, let me back up a little bit because well, I do, well, I do accept that, right? Um, there are certain, there are certainly kind times where, um, let me ask you a counter question, which is, um, must one be in communion with someone who is abusing them? Mm. Right. Um, and there's certainly a question of culpability there. And I'm not claiming that Rome is being abusive in, in a certain regard, but there are, uh, certainly mitigating circumstances where let, let's sure. say that a bishop is being incredibly abusive towards a particular parish, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the parish lapses its communion, but doesn't fully reject and say, I, you know, I hate this bishop and I never want to do anything, but there's very clearly a state of, of immense damage sure. in the relationship sure. between, sure. between sure. these sure. two, sure. right? There yeah. is a bit of wiggle room in there. Oh yeah, absolutely, and, and, absolutely. And it's yeah. always been the cases that the Eastern churches have tried to reestablish communion with Rome whenever they were underneath uh, a, 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 a Christian uh, leader, right? Uh, the right. other circumstances it was a, is a very uh, lamentable part of our history. Um, but the moment basically we reemerge, right, which doesn't happen until the middle of the 19th century from, from, uh, from uh, rule by the Turks, uh, there is almost immediately uh, a move towards reestablishing dialogue, towards reestablishing and repairing their relationship. And that's even after many of the good natured uh, Orthodox who uh, were exhibiting Christian charity themselves left the Eastern Communion and went to Rome. And yet even in this case, uh, Orthodoxy is still trying to seek out and find a way to reenter uh, communion with Rome. And I think that that's objective, right? I want to use that term again. That's an objective reality that has to be uh, taken into account. So I'm not claiming I have all the answers and I'm not claiming it's, it's all gray and I'm not claiming we should uh, you know, throw up our hands and have some sort of uh, Protestant notion of an invisible church. But it does seem that there is a nuance to objective matters in this situation yeah. and that it needs to be taken into account and done pastorally with charity. Yeah, and I and I wholeheartedly agree that there's there's mitigating circumstances that mitigate culpability and maybe even reduce it to nothing, especially if they're being abused by a member of the clergy. I, I'm right on board there, um, Father Deacon. I want to come to you here. What what would you say about my syllogism? I mean, um, if if this idea of being in communion with the Pope is something handed down by Christ, and we should embrace everything handed down by Christ. Therefore, Eastern Orthodox should accept the idea that they should be in communion with Rome. What, what say you? What I would say is there are, there are truths that object that truths that exist objectively, right? They're objective truths, but at the same time, a lot of these truths are incomplete. And at the same time, there was a whole question of emphasis. What do we emphasize, right? You can state something that's completely true objectively, but if you emphasize the wrong things, it could do more harm than good. I'll give you an example. So years ago, I, uh, I, was, I went out to dinner with a, a Roman Catholic friend who's a very you know, conservative, traditional Roman Catholic. We went to dinner at a, a Chinese restaurant in a city. And our waiter was a recent immigrant from China. And uh, he was very nice, wanted to chat with us. And at one point, he asked us about our faith because he saw us praying before we ate. Mm. And we explained that we're Catholic. And he asked a very important question. I'm not familiar with Catholics. What do Catholics believe? What are you all about? But that was an opportunity. Before I could answer, my friend jumped in, and, and my friend's response was, we believe that you must submit to Pope, to the Pope. You must submit your will to the will of the Pope, and that's the path to salvation. At that point, you could see that he, he just kind of locked up, right? The, the Chinese waiter froze. He didn't know how to respond, and that was the end of the conversation. Uh, nothing about Jesus, you know, nothing about you know, a grace, it was, you must submit to the Pope. Mm. Now, objectively, what this person said is, you know, it, you can make a case that it's objectively true, but the emphasis was completely wrong and it did more harm than good. Um, you know, a syllogism like the one you're giving, uh, while it, it's a fun intellectual exercise, when you're actually on the ground, you know, trying to create unity between Christians, uh, I'm not sure that that kind of syllogism is really helpful. I personally yeah, it's, would it's, just, it's definitely not the yeah. way that you would evangelize. <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. And I'll, I'll say this. I think it speaks volumes that today, at least, today, at yeah. least, there is no Catholic Patriarch of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. and there is no Orthodox Patriarch of Rome. 
the fact that those positions are, are, are vacant on both sides shows that at some deeper level, there's an acknowledgement that, that, that things aren't as shattered as they appeared and there is a hope. You know, it's kind of like when you have a situation where a couple breaks up, but they, they keep a seat at the dinner table in case they, they, they come back together again. It's that kind of a thing. That seat is being kept at the dinner table with a hope that they come back. Mm. I, I think that's a great point we can emphasize scripturally too, right? Uh, I think it's pretty clear that divine scriptures uh, reveal that the 12 kingdoms are supposed to be united under the, under the son of David, right? And yet objectively, there was a kingdom of Israel and a kingdom of Judah, so there was not that case, right? But what do we still get in, in the prophe prophecy of Ezekiel? Uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel is that the rod which is broken in two shall be reunited and shall become one, right? And so the, there's, there's precedent for this, even within divine revelation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm not, I don't want to merely toss aside that syllogism or its power, mm -hmm. but there is some objective nuance to this uh, that is part of our divine revelation. But you would agree, even in the Old Testament, you should not break away um, from the worship and sacrifice that's offered in Jerusalem and start sacrificing. And Correct. So that's, yeah. that's, in fact, the rooting of the entire uh, thing, which I've been mentioning all this time, the erection of a foreign altar, right? Mm. This, this is all part and part of divine revelation um, that uh, the uh, the ruling of the, of the kingdoms by David is to ensure that there is one altar to the right. one Lord God, right? And uh, this is this should be the driving concern for all of our churches, right? For the Roman Church, for the Church of Constantinople, all of these ancient patriarchates, we should be striving together to have one worthy sacrifice to the Lord God. And thankfully, that is what we are trying to do. It's not perfect, mm -hmm. and there's lots of fits and starts, and uh, there's lots of political uh, agendas in the way, but... I think that it's true that on both sides, people are working for this mm -hmm. and it has to continue to be the case. I have two more things I want to get to. So we're going to do a lightning round here, round three. So um, are Eastern Orthodox in heresy for rejecting the filioque and the papal dogmas and maybe some of them who reject the Immaculate Conception? And I know some of them may not reject the filioque, but y you know what I mean, those who do. Are they in heresy? Father Deacon, starting with you. No. <laughs> and how come oh. you say they would not be at heresy? I mean, you would say it's dogmatic to affirm the papal dogmas, uh, right? So. I would say these are dogmatic things, but at the same time, we have to consider, uh, you know, for example, Pope Benedict, when he was still Joseph Ratzinger, he had a proposal to reunify the churches, which was simply the Orthodox would have to accept no more than they did during the first thousand years. And, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. But those There's dogmas been, are there in the first thousand years. I mean, that's why they're yes. dogmas. Well, but the thing is, during the first thousand years, they were more in the state of a seed in right. many cases. They weren't explicitly, you know, developed and understood. Mm -hmm. um, but to denounce somebody as a heretic because they haven't gone along with a development that took place completely in their absence. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far. No. So you say as long as they accept the seed of the dogma, not necessarily the way it developed and flourished and the way it's expressed and articulated and practically done. You would just say the the seed of the dogma would need to be accepted. And, and the seed of all those dogmas are easily found in Eastern Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're there. They're there, every one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but a person may not recognize it once it's developed. Yeah. Yeah. Nathaniel, what, what say ye? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, St. Basil the Great, when dealing with the Nuenamachians, he uh, responds that he is willing to extend communion to those bishops, uh, not to necessarily accept the full definition, uh, mm -hmm. but who are at least uh, willing to accept that it is not heretical and not fight against it. Right. And I think that there is a very long history in our tradition of making this the criteria for union, that while we clearly have a dogmatic definition that in many cases uh, it is sufficient to uh, to admit its orthodoxy and to not fight against it, even if you may not fully embrace it yourself. Now, wasn't that prior to the definition of the consubstantiality of the Holy Spirit? Yes, Yes and no, uh, and he bases this on the creed of Nicaea. Um, so he basically says that this is implicitly defined in the council, uh, in the creed of Nicaea. Um, there's a bunch of nuance here I don't want to get into because 
Uh, I'm currently writing a paper on the question of what it means to call a creed Nicene. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, let, let, let's suffice it to say that um, he believed that there already was a, a definition sufficiently in place to make this criteria. And while the remaining definition had yet to be defined you know, in its full articulation, uh, I think it's important to note the strategy here is, is the, the Catholic strategy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, anyway, Father Joseph. No, as long as that uh, person is not saying that the precise formula of the Latin church is by definition a heresy, that the exact way the Latin church formulates, what were the three again, the filioque, the... Filioque, uh, papal dogmas, immaculate conception. Right, so if, if the way that the Latin church formulates it is a heresy, is very different from saying, this is not the way we understand it. This is mm -hmm. the way we understand it. And as Father Deacon Anthony said, there is the seed of that, even in, especially in the liturgical tradition, as well as in some of the writings of the fathers. But if they were to say, your definition of, uh, of, of the papal dogmas at Vatican I, I reject those, and I think that's heretical. What would you say? Well, that's, that's the beginning of a discussion. I, I reject those. I think it's heretical. I think you would say, well, then why? Why Why do you think that that's heretical? And that's where the ecumenical discussion comes in, because it brings out nuances in the reasons for rejections that simply aren't there in, uh, what do they call it, popular armchair theology. Sure. Uh, but, 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 but the fact is that, and I learned that, you know, to, to, to call someone or to call something a, a heresy or a heretic yeah. is yeah. a very, very serious accusation. Because uh, most of the time, what people call heresy, it actually has nothing to do with, so to borrow uh, Denzinger language, it has nothing to do with de fide statements. Mm -hmm. It has to, because here's the thing as well, even in Latin theology, it recognizes a hierarchy of truths. Mm -hmm. Some things are de fide, other things are uh, tolerated opinions and every shade in between. And so what we call a heresy uh, is something that directly attacks something that is defined of the faith. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, yeah, I, you know, there, there are nuances there, and, and it is very difficult to define things, which is probably why the East turns around and says that they're nervous about defining things too much or too carefully. But once something has been defined, um, you know, there's a reason why it takes a while, and there's a reason why um, a hair is pulled uh, over these definitions, because it has to be something that, that expresses what the church believes in as succinct uh, a way, uh, in a succinct a way possible, um, in order then. But then again, it's it's um, it's very um, open to different uh, to different perceptions, which is why, as an Eastern Catholic, I can say I I I'm not saying the filioque, but it, it's not a heresy because the Son and the Holy Spirit are both. Uh, in um, the Father and the Son, rather, are both involved somehow in the procession of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's just a question of what what are you saying uh, as mm -hmm. a Latin, and is it is it a heresy? Um, and I I can't do that. So, but but then if an Orthodox Christian turns around and says I I can't necessarily agree with that either, it, it's to call to call that a heresy is is it would involve a number of steps beyond merely that first response. Now, of course, we're, we're speaking about dogmas that are of the faith, that are de, de fide. I mean, the filioque, I would say, um, the papal uh, papal definitions there at Vatican I and also the Immaculate Conception, those would all be primary objects of infallibility. So they'd be dogmatic. So would the distinction between formal heresy and material heresy come come at play here? Do, do you think that that would be applicable? That's that a very good. Yeah, that Sorry. might be a, a good Latin way to articulate it. Um, mm -hmm. What I would want to say is that the the difference between an ideologue and a Catholic is that an ideologue demands subjection to a particular formula, mm. where a Catholic allows for compatibility of distinct formulas. Sure. Right? As but long just, as the proposition yeah, itself this, is the same. This, right. This does right. not mean that all formulas are acceptable, but it right. means that some formulas can be shown to be 
uh, practically sure. equi equivalent, right? And there's a long standing tradition for this. Sure, absolutely. But it, but if they're rejecting the proposition, yeah, then um, I think it's, I think it is. Yeah, a, as we've been material talking about, here, so. about the objective nature of things, right? I think sure. at that point you are beginning to have objective material for the question of heresy, and sure. now we're asking a question about culpability. So, yeah, you know, again, here's the free fall part. So would it be acceptable to say that um, when it comes to the Eastern Orthodox and, of course, with potential uh, reunion, it is fair to say that the Eastern Orthodox would need to accept the propositions that have been dogmatically defined, but they don't have to express them in the way that we express them. Is that fair? They, they need compatible uh, articulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if we look at just when an Eastern Orthodox Christian is received into communion with Rome, they can say by making a profession of faith. Well, what exactly does that mean? Do they have to read uh, all the councils of Abatum? Do they have to read Denzinger? Do they have to read the Code of Canon Law and the Second Vatican Council? What exactly does that mean? Right. Uh, and I think that the Church intentionally leaves that open for this very reason. Mm -hmm. um, Father Deacon, did, did you have any comments there? Yes, uh, to quote a, a great theologian, um, that would be an ecumenical matter. <laughs> Was that Father Ted? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I caught that. <laughs> All right. So last last uh, round here. All right. Shifting gears a little bit. Um, as far as the Eastern Catholic perspective on Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, what do you guys think about the issue right now taking place within Eastern Orthodoxy between Moscow, Alexandria, and uh, Constantinople, especially in, in most recent news with Russia accepting some of the clergy um, of Alexandria, some of the priests that petitioned to be under Russia now, but still are in Africa, Russia now accepting them under its wing. What do you think about the issue where there are internal divisions here? Would you say that this is an internal schism, that this is of the same magnitude as the schism that happened between Catholics and Orthodox? But what are your, your thoughts here, Father Deacon? Um, th there's definitely, you know, something akin to a schism there. Again, we've talked about the, the different possible definitions of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe that, you know, rival altars are being erected, mm -hmm. but there definitely is a, a real, you know, tearing of the body there, right, mm -hmm. in, in a certain sense. Um, but that being said, if you look at the history of Christianity, even during the first thousand years, bishops would go in and out of communion with each other all the time. That wasn't mm -hmm. that entirely unusual especially when communication was, was, was challenged, you know, because of language or distance or the danger of travel. Um, it wasn't unusual for bishops to be in and out of communion with, with one another, even with the Bishop of Rome for periods of time and then come back into communion again. And I, I kind of anticipate the situation among the, the Orthodox currently is being similar to that. And really, as we discussed in the past, Michael, I think the, the schism between the Catholics and Orthodox would have followed the very same path, even if it wasn't for the Crusades, it, because that's when, you know, the crusaders came and they began setting up rival altars, literally, you know, rival bishops. I think that's what made the schism a, a real thing that lasted. Um, but I don't anticipate the situation with the Orthodox being uh, a deep lasting wound to the same extent as the current split between the Catholics and the Orthodox going back for the past thousand years is. Nathaniel, what do you think? Um, I think we should pray for the situation. It's, it's a very unfortunate one. I'm not as optimistic as, as Father Anthony. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there's a rival altars being set up. I think the establishment of an exarchate in Alexandria mm -hmm. is, is roughly the equivalent. Uh, the only thing that distinguishes it is that they are not claiming that he, uh, the exarch is the uh, official bishop of Alexandria. Right. But this is a pretty, a pretty um, sharp consolation. Yeah. Uh, the, the distinction here is not one that's large. Um, I think that the thing that we need to most recognize is that all of these incredibly serious divisions uh, are almost always drawn along imperial concerns. And this has mm -hmm. been the case since the very beginning of Christendom, mm -hmm. um, right? The, the division between, um, there's a lot I don't like in Roman, Romanides, but I think one of the things that Romanides captures very, very well is the notion of the division of the churches emerging out of a competition between the Carolingians and the Byzantines 
uh, mm -hmm. and their you know, imperial uh, offspring. And mm -hmm. uh, we see the same kinds of things in the West, right, in the, in the 19th century uh, under Napoleon, where the concern is to set up a national French church that is subjected to the, to the French state. And I think we are seeing a lot of the same things emerging now in this situation. And it's a very, very difficult, hard period to go through. And so please pray for these people. Um, it's, it's not an easy situation. Uh, Father Joseph? On the one hand, I'm looking at the situation as an outsider, as a Catholic, thinking, well, boy, I'm glad I'm Catholic, because at least I have the universality to latch on to. Um, on the other hand, um, it, it, it's sad because um, I, I am looking at it through 21st century eyes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living in a, in a great monolith now, which is the Catholic Church. But knowing historically that there were minor divisions in history, as well as major divisions. Um, and it, it just causes me at once to be to be thankful and at the same time to to look at it um, with um, with sadness. Hmm. Now, there's a question here. Uh, last, last part, we're wrapping it up. Um, are Roman Latin Rite Catholics who become Orthodox in sin or in spiritual danger? Would you counsel them to come back to the Catholic Church or stay Orthodox? Anybody who wants to grab it, go ahead and take it. Um, I think I think that um, all of these situations are lamentable. I think there's a big question of culpability here, particularly in the challenging times we we see our, we find ourselves. Um, of course, Tolkien reminds us that uh, all those who uh, live through such times wish that they didn't have to, but we have to do the best with what we can. Um, in terms of what I would counsel them, uh, you know, I think tearing people away from communities is really personally destructive far more than we really notice. And I think that the more we do this, the more we isolate people from healthy communities of faith, the more they will tend towards atheism and uh, and that's the real enemy here, right? The real enemy is losing faith. So, um, yeah, I would, I would, I would, I'm not a pastor, but I would counsel people to move slow, take stock in, in where they are, preserve their relationships, say their prayer rule, and try to grow as best as they can. And, um, yeah, on a case by case basis. Any other uh, offers there? Father, Father Joseph, did you have a... Well, I, I am a pastor, and I have seen people bounce from denomination to, to denomination. And mm. uh, after a while, after two or three or four, you know, it gets to a point where you do want to ask, what is it you're looking for? What mm. do you see? Um, I do believe as a Catholic that I do have something to offer. At the same time, I would want people to come for very good reasons. Um, and I wouldn't want people to leave uh, unless in conscience they, they think that that's what they need for salvation. Um, because otherwise, you know, I do, as, as an Eastern Catholic, I do appreciate the Ignatian method, which says not to veer away from your path unless you have a deliberate, clear sense that you're being called somewhere. It's usually your conscience. So I've learned that from the Latin West, and I do value that advice. Uh, Father Deacon, did you have any comments there? Uh, it's hard to know the situation with, when those type of things occur. Um, you know, it's hard to know, number one, how educated the person was about Catholicism or, or how convincingly Catholicism was explained to them. And it's hard to know the reasons why they felt it was so necessary to break communion with Rome. Uh, in my experience, a, a lot of Latin Catholics who become Orthodox, they do so because they're running away from something. Uh, there are exceptions. You know, sometimes they fall in love with the East and they feel that's the only way to, to experience the East because there are no Eastern Catholics anywhere near them. Mm -hmm. um, but it, oftentimes they're looking for greener pastures. And mm -hmm. if they're looking for it in Orthodoxy, they're going to find out that the grass isn't greener on the other side. They have, they have their own problems, some similar to ours, some different. Mm -hmm. I know right now I, I've been hearing a lot from uh, Latin Catholics who appreciate the, the old uh, so-called Tridentine Mass, mm -hmm. who have been talking about becoming Orthodox um, because they seem to think that that will, you know, be the answer to their problems. They're in for a rude awakening. Uh, right. You know, if 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 your issue with Pope Francis is he's not tolerating liturgical diversity within the Latin Church, um, in the Orthodox world, that's not the place to find liturgical diversity. 
It's Byzantine or, or no way, with a few exceptions, where there are very controversial, you know, Western right Orthodox parishes. Um, so it's hard to know the reasons. It's hard to say that they're in a state of sin or not. I know that I objectively could not make that jump, though. Mm -hmm. If I were to become Orthodox and break communion with Rome, I would be going against what I know to be true, and, and I could not live with myself on the level of conscience, but I can't judge other people. Um, one more question here. Uh, what can Latins do best to help Eastern Orthodox and Eastern Catholics? Anybody want to take that one? What can Latin Catholics do best to help Orthodox and Eastern Catholics? I'll take that one quickly. Um, educate. Educate fellow Latin Catholics that Eastern Christians exist and that Eastern Catholics exist and that it's possible to be Catholic and it's possible to be Christian in ways other than just the Latin way. Because this is a big problem I run into all the time. You know, um, I see people saying in the Catholic Church, you know, all priests must be celibate. And then you bring up, well, we have married priests in the Eastern Catholic Churches. That's heresy. You can't say that. And unfortunately, these type of things come up all the time. And this creates barriers between Catholics and Orthodox. And it also creates very uncomfortable situations for Eastern Catholics. So if you're a Latin Catholic and you know that we exist and you appreciate us, do whatever's in your power to educate your fellow Latin Catholics about the Eastern Christians and to explain to them that there are a diverse there are diverse ways of being Catholic. It's just not one way. Yeah, I remember um, a Latin right Catholic once on Facebook anathematizing Eastern Catholics because they, they thought that they were um, outside of communion. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen articles in, in mainstream Catholic publications, you know, saying we must fight against evils such as, you know, uh, abortion, you know, contraception, you know, transgenderism and married priests, <laughs> you know, they're, right. they're throwing yeah. Father Joseph in there with abortion yeah. and transgenderism, yeah. you know, right. it's just, <laughs> uh, it just blows my mind. And I've yeah. seen that more yeah. times than I can count. I have too. I've seen that a lot. Uh, Father Joseph, Nathaniel, did you have any comments here? Well, I would say as well, encourage uh, people uh, who are Eastern Catholics in their parishes to, um, if possible, rediscover and return to their tradition. I mean, 99% of Eastern Catholics, I mean, I'm making that number up, but it certainly feels like it. 99% of Eastern Catholics are no longer practicing in their in their parishes for good reasons or, or not. Um, of course, it's, it's wide and it's usually intermarriage and geographical movement and things of that nature. But if every Latin uh, parish had a, a, a specific way of encouraging those, for example, rather than registering Eastern Catholics in, in parishes, and I know registration doesn't make a person a parishioner, it's geographical, but rather than doing that, to have the priests, to have the leaders of the local parishes um, uh, systematically pointing Eastern Catholic faithful to their local Eastern Catholic parishes because all the talent that they bring, even just their physical presence, um, to, to bring that back to their canonical parish. And that way we can benefit, not merely financially, but in terms of the talents that they have uh, and, and so that we can have a vibrant parish life. So that the Latin church and the Latin parishes are not just, the, you know, the the um, the go to of of, Lat of of Catholic vibrancy in the local diocese, but that our parishes can be that as well, and it should be according to the mind of the church, because Eastern Catholics not only have a right to follow their tradition, they actually have an obligation. If you read the teachings of the church, they have a right and an obligation to make sure that it survives and thrives. Yeah, I, I would I would agree completely, um, and I I would just love to see more cross pollination in both directions. Now, and by cross pollination, I don't mean let's have all the Latin churches adopt Eastern practices and Eastern churches uh, adopt Latin practices. But the more we get to know one another, the more we get to share our traditions, the the richer our lives become. I can't tell you how many times uh, my own spiritual journey has been. Uh, deeply enriched by Latin traditions or customs that I have learned. Um, and I'm sure that Latins probably feel the same way uh, about our Eastern customs. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a real need to know one another and uh, beyond that to love one another. 
there's actually two super chats here. We'll grab these really quickly. Uh, for anyone, are the arguments being made here applicable to the situation with the SSPX in the West? If not, what's the difference? Couldn't we say there's canonically a regular status between East and West? Anybody want to grab that one? It's been the thing I've been harping on, right? That there is sometimes middle ground. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's very clear, you know, that um, the vast majority of the SSPX still believes that Pope Francis is the Bishop of Rome, right? They're, uh, they are attempting to maintain their own traditions um, and their own liturgy, their own liturgical traditions you know, in that regard. Um, but it's also clear that Rome... You know, in granting, for example, the ability to, for uh, SSPX to hear confessions and whatnot regards this as one of these irregular situations, which is uh, neither objectively schism nor objectively full unity. Um, and it's, it's part of these uh, things that are in between. So, uh, yeah, I, I would agree. And uh, anybody else wanted to comment on that? Yeah, is it not the case historically that the selection of bishops by the Pope of Rome is a, a rather recent thing. And so, you know, again, going back to one possible argument made by the SSPX is that they're doing something that probably was done for most of the church's history, namely that the, the, the bishops were selected without the direct involvement of the Pope of Rome. So yes, we tend to look at these things in, with modern contemporary eyes, forgetting the the vast uh, majority of the church's history has a bit of a different experience. I think it's a really important actually to note something there, Father Joseph, um, which is that the papal selection of bishops emerged out of a context under Napoleon, where Napoleon unilaterally replaced every bishop in the country of France, right? Something that is... Uh, astoundingly untraditional uh, and yet he was able to do so only by convincing the Pope to do so and that's only 200 years ago um, before that it was virtually unheard of that the Pope was appointing every every bishop everywhere right so yeah these are very modern phenomena uh, last one here killer Bob asks what do you think of Alexis Toth <laughs> <laughs> any, Father Dick, any, any, any comments there? Uh, not a fan, not a fan. <laughs> For those who aren't familiar with him, Alexis Toth was an Eastern Catholic priest who came to the United States. He was badly mistreated by the Roman Catholic bishop in uh, Minneapolis, I believe, um, Archbishop John Ireland. And back then, there were no Eastern Catholic bishops in the United States. Uh, this was a long time ago. So he ended up joining forces with the, the Russian Orthodox Church, and trying to recruit Eastern Catholics to Russian Orthodoxy, which gave birth to the modern day OCA here in Orthodox Church in America. Uh, I, I'm sympathetic with him. I'm sympathetic with the way he was mistreated, the way his, his followers were mistreated. I mean, the Roman bishop said, send them all to a Roman church, you know, have all your people become Roman. He, he, it was awful. But my sympathy for Alexis Toth uh, waned significantly when I took the time to read a book that he wrote. He wrote a book, I believe it's called Where We Look for Truth or something of that nature, uh, explaining his reasons and explaining his, his position. And the book was one of the most vile, hateful, anti-Catholic screeds I've ever read. It was so awful and so dripping with hatred that after reading that, I could no longer look at Alexis Toth with the same level of sympathy. I mean, it's, it's so bad in some places, you would think that it was written you know, in the comment section on Facebook, That's how bad it is. <laughs> Yeah, Any other um, comments there? Yeah, it, it's a it's a difficult problem, right? When you have these kinds of abuse, and it clearly it clearly brings out the worst in everyone involved, and extremely damages uh, the relationships uh, of the people, not only uh, to the church but to Christ. Um, I think we should recognize also that there is a political component here, um, and. Making a saint has always had a political dimension to it. Um, but for example, the OCA calls him uh, a confessor and defender of orthodoxy. Um, I, I think that's a, a little bit hyperbolic uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, the, the grand scheme of things. Um, and, and I should think we should resist these attempts to uh, do what we might call ecclesiastical nation building, right? Mm -hmm. So in the, in the 19th century, one of the great problems we have is that uh, everyone sort of came to believe that uh, every every uh, group of people should have their own nation, 
And this was immediately uh, followed by everyone defining what they mean by nation to include the people they want and exclude the people they don't want. And we should really just avoid this sort of tendency uh, in our ecclesiastical circles, right? Um, that, that this is not the calling of Christ to try to do ecclesiastical nation building, uh, that we are called to one communion in one baptism to the one Lord, uh, Jesus Christ. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's roughly my take on the situation. Gentlemen, thank you all so much for coming on and doing this. This was extremely, extremely fun to do, and we need to do another roundtable. Like I said, it's been a while since we've had a roundtable on R&T, and I'm happy that we had this one. This was excellent. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on and uh, sharing your thoughts here. This was incredibly helpful and enlightening. Um, so, uh, you, you know, Father Deacon, is, is there anything that you could maybe uh, refer our listeners to to put in a plug for any of your content? Yes, you know, uh, I mentioned this before, the Becoming Byzantine series. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still moving forward with that, and Father Joseph has been working on that as well. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working our way through Christ our Pascha, which is the Ukrainian Catholic Catechism, and it's it's a great opportunity to learn the basics of, of the Catholic faith from an Eastern Christian perspective. Nathaniel, uh, go ahead and put in a plug for any of your work. Um. I won't put in a plug. I don't have, I'm, I'm starting a company. So my life has been very busy. Lately. I got you. Um, I hear you. <laughs> but I do, but I do have two kids with health issues. So pray for my family. Mm. Uh, it's uh, it's always an ongoing concern for us. So uh, say a prayer for them if you wouldn't mind. Absolutely. Understood. Uh, Father Joseph, do you have a plug you want to put in? Yes. Just the Byzant uh, becoming Byzantine course is uh, something that is really helping a lot of not just Eastern Catholics, but Latin Catholics who want to learn more about our tradition. It's a year-long walk through uh, our catechism, which is all available online, and it's a way of taking it throughout the course of the year. And the videos are very short, 10 to 15 minutes, which means hopefully uh, I'm not overwhelming you. I, I'm only doing the first third of it, but hopefully I'm not overwhelming you. And lastly, I'm going to put a plug in for Reason and Theology. I've yeah, listened yeah, to the videos for a while, and... Uh, I've learned a lot myself, and you know, as a as a, a, a theologian in training, it really does exercise the mind. And so, I'm grateful for what you've done, Michael. Awesome, thank you so much for that. And yeah, I've been watching your your Byzantine uh, becoming Byzantine videos as well. So I really appreciate what y'all are doing as well, Father Deacon. I know you were uh, also on some of those videos, so I appreciate your your work there. And also, of course, uh, uh, Father uh, Daniel Dozier, who who is on them as well. So shout out to him. Uh, but again, gentlemen, thank y'all so much for coming on and doing this. This was awesome. Honored to have you all on. And everybody, thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Help us grow. Uh, hit the bell for notifications notifications so that you know when we go live and also leslie as i always say check us out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology is the address scrolling there at the bottom of your screen if you want to support what we're doing here we'll see y'all later